Um, so what we're going to do today then is um, first reflect some on how to understand uh, the relationship of Kant's ethics both to utilitarian ethics and to sort of standard paradigm deontology. And then talk a little bit more about um, objections both to Kant's view and to standard deontological views. Now, it, it, it's easy and standard to um, treat Kant as a deontologist. The first thing we want to see is that's, as it were, only partly right. I mean, it's true that Kant is no utilitarian, but it's also true, as you see if you reflect on what we learned about Kant's universal law test, that he's no straightforward deontologist either. Start with Kant's relation to utilitarianism. Um, the form of utilitarianism that Kant is closest to, and that some people um, sometimes mistakenly suppose Kant espouses, is um, his rule utilitarianism. Good for <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, just just getting, getting the old PowerPoint set up here. Um, so, I mean, someone might think, right, that um, Kant was a rule utilitarian, because they might think Kant, what you do with Kant's test is you um, identify the maxim, and then you imagine everyone on the maxim and what you acting on the maxim, and then you ask is, you know, would that be good, right? Would that bring about a lot of happiness, right? So, if your test was identify the maxim, universalize it, and ask, does universalizing that maxim bring more happiness than universalizing any other maxim relevantly like it? That's a kind of rule utilitarianism, yeah? Okay, so, but look, the key thing to see about Kant's test is that's not what it asks you to do, right? Kant's test does not tell you universalize and then see if the consequences are good, right? Kant's test, as we've seen, but it's worth emphasizing, asks you to do something quite different. It asks you to universalize and then see if you can do so without your will contradicting itself. So it's a very different test and it's, you know, it's clearly not act utilitarianism and nor properly understood is it rule utilitarianism. I've got a, a PowerPoint on this topic that we can turn to now. Everyone got that? 
Um, that's worth bringing out, right? But I mean, in, given the way we standardly set things up, it shouldn't be surprising, right? That's a much more surprising conclusion, actually, which some people sometimes interestingly argue for, but the much more surprising conclusion would be that Kant was a utilitarian. The, you know, the more striking thing, given the way one normally sets these up, things up and characterizes them, is that Kant is um, not a simple paradigm deontologist either. Remember our paradigm of deontology? So the deontologist, so understood, is the person who thinks that morality consists of a number of simple absolute rules, you know, never lie, never steal, never break a promise, stuff like that. Right? And the way we set it up initially, that sort of view is kind of the natural uh, contrast with utilitarianism. It's striking then that Kant, on reflection, doesn't really seem to be a straightforward deontologist either. Um, Rachel actually brings this out quite nicely in uh, Chapter 9 of the Elements of Moral Philosophy by talking about Kant and Elizabeth Anscombe. So Elizabeth Anscombe was a um, very celebrated 20th century philosopher. Right, and the thing about Anscombe was she really was a deontologist. Right, um, she were, you know she uh, subscribed to a kind of deontology that had its roots in her um, Catholic upbringing and strong Catholic beliefs. Right? So, do you remember in that chapter what um, Rachel's begins by talking about is Anscombe's opposition to um, Oxford giving an honorary degree to Harry Truman, right? Um, on the grounds that, you know, in ordering the dropping of the atomic bombs, Truman violated absolute moral rules, right? And you couldn't justify, you know, violating these absolute moral rules on the grounds Truman would have given, right? That they had better consequences. Then, though, um, in section 9.3, Rachel's turns to Kant sort of attempting to justify an absolute prohibition on lying and to Anscombe's criticisms, right? The most striking bit of this um, is, I guess, it's the what's well, the first paragraph on page one thirty. Um, I'll read the second half of that paragraph after sort of the formulation of the bit of reasoning involved. Rachel says, although Anscombe agreed with Kant's conclusion, she was kept quick to point out an error in his reasoning. Difficulty arises in step two. Why should we say that if you lied, you would be following the rule, it is okay to lie? Perhaps your maxim would be, I will lie when doing so would save someone's life. That rule would not be self-defeating. It could become a universal law. And so by Kant's own theory, it would be all right for you to lie. Categorical imperative is useless, Anscombe says, without some guidance as to how to formulate the rules. As some of that, I want to come back to and contest in certain ways a bit later. But what it does sort of usefully bring out is the idea that um, Kant's universal law test is unlikely to generate absolute rules, right? Why is that? Well, consider the kind of action you might think about, like lying, right? According to Kant's test, what you have to do is figure out what someone's maxim is. And there are very different maxims that someone could have for um, telling a lie, right? They could have the maxim of lying whenever it will be to their advantage. Maybe that one would be self-defeating. But it's very different to have the kind of maxim that would be involved in uh, this famous case that 
Kant discusses in an essay Rachel refers to, the maxim of lying when it will prevent someone from being murdered. Right? It's quite plausible that you run Kant's test on, you know, lie whenever it would be to my advantage, and it turns out that you can't universalize that without your will contradicting itself. But by contrast, you can universalize, you know, I will lie whenever that's the only way to prevent someone being murdered. So, the first difference between Kant and standard deontology is, for, for Kant, interpreted in terms of the universal law test, unlike standard deontology, it looks like um, the details of the maxim matter, and it looks like there's more than one essentially different maxim that you could act on associated with any of the actions involved in these simple rules like lying or breaking promises or stealing or whatever it would be. The other difference is this, look. Um, the standard deontologist, as normally portrayed, is, as you may say, pluralistic, right? Standard deontologist, that is, thinks there's, you know, some number of absolute rules. You've just got to obey all of them. Kant, by contrast, is, as one standardly says, monistic, right? In the sense that Kant has a single... Um, formula from which all the more specific rules are derived, right? Standard deontology doesn't have that. All right, so um, I've got a PowerPoint now sort of summarizing that, giving you the reasons why um, Kant's view does not really fit the paradigm of deontology. Everyone got this down? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So now turn to the question sort of how adequate is Kant's account of the content of morality, right? How good a job does the universal law test give? do of um, determining what actions are right and what actions are wrong. Like most elements in Kant, there's, a, there's actually scholarly controversy about just what he's committed to here. But there are definitely passages, we don't have the most striking ones, but we got, we got one, in our extract, where Kant seems to commit himself to the view that the universal law test is the test for whether actions are morally right or wrong. 
right? So, I mean, if you want to know whether an action is morally right or wrong, just run the universal law test and that will tell you, right? The bit in our extract where he says something like that is uh, page 65, second paragraph, second sentence. He says, we must be able to will that a maxim of our action become a universal law. This is the canon of the moral estimation of our action generally. And there, there are other places, as I say, we don't have in the extract here, where he commits himself to that claim in, in more, even more robust versions. So the, the suggestion appears to be, right, we have, you know, this... Uh, ordinary pre-theoretical idea of moral rightness and moral wrongness, right? And Kant suggests the way to tell whether something's morally right or morally wrong is just to run this test on them. This test will give you a perfect comprehensive way of um, sorting all potential actions into the categories of either right or wrong. So if that's what Kant claims, is he right about it? You, 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 sh you should ask, right? I mean, is he right in thinking that he's got um, the single, uh, complete, comprehensive test for morality and immorality? I want to suggest he's not right. I think there are... Um, at least two families of problem cases that show that this test is not, you know, uh, an across-the-board, reliable test of rightness and wrongness. Um, so, um, we can uh, distinguish i say these two classes of problem cases. I'll give you a PowerPoint eventually for this, but, but maybe I'll do them first, right? Um, so look, the first kind of case involves what we might call innocent non-universalizable maxims, right? Th that is, action on maxims that seem to us morally perfectly fine, but which turn out to fail Kant's test. Here what you want is just anything which seems perfectly fine thing for a person to do, but it's just impossible for everyone to do it, right? Um, So, uh, the one I'll eventually give you on the PowerPoint, try this. I mean, I will buy a house in Kansas. Right? So, perfectly fine maxim to act on, seems intuitively not immoral at all. But probably fails the universalization test, right? I mean, not everyone can buy a house in Kansas. There are enough houses in Kansas, right? It's impossible that everyone successfully act on that maxim. But, again, you know, intuitively, there seems like there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you can, and once you sort of see how that works, you, it's easy to generate lots of others that are apparently of that form, apparently maxims that seem just morally just fine, but fail the test. The other class I want to draw your attention to of problem cases for the universal law test is what we can call guilty universalizable maxims. Um, maxims that intuitively seem morally wrong, but seem like they pass the test. To approach these, um, I want to sort of take the problem in steps and start with something that, um, start with the thing that I didn't quite like in that passage that I read from Rachel's talking about Anscombe before. Right? Now look, the suggestion that Rachel seemed to endorse that came from that Anscombe discussion was the suggestion that um, Kant's test is useless because you never know what maxim to put in, right? The idea is for any action of yours there are, there are a number of possible ways of describing it and um, you know presumably on some descriptions it will be okay and on some descriptions it won't, right? Um, so consider a bank robber, right? Um, well, a person who's contemplating robbing a bank, right? Um, 
the point that Anscombe makes and Rachel's wants to endorse seems to go something like this. Well, who knows if on Kant's test the bank robber's action's okay, right? Because the, the bank robber's maxim might be, you know, whenever I need money, I'll rob a bank. Maybe that fails the test. Right? But then the bank robber can try a different description, right? Whenever I'm in need of money and my name is such and such and it is such and such a date and um, it's such and such a temperature and whatnot, I'll rob a bank. Right? And then what they do is they, um, you know, make the circumstances so specific that there won't be any trouble universalizing that maxim because it will only ever apply to one person on one occasion. Right? So the objections, I think, as suggested by uh, Anscombe and endorsed by Rachel, is you know the test's hopeless because you never know you know which description to put in. Right? Okay. Now look to that objection. There is, I think, a good response. The response says, look, not just any description of your action properly captures your maxim. Because your maxim has to reflect your real intentions. And that has in, in particular to reflect, you know, um, what really guided your action and what kinds of changes in the situation actually would have led you to act differently. So the person responding to the, this criticism from Anscombe and Rachel's on Kant's behalf says, look, the thing about the bank robber is the bank robber's maxim is not all this very specific stuff about, you know, it being such and such a day and such and such a temperature. Because the point is the guy would have robbed the bank anyway. It wasn't that his action really depended on that at all. His maxim, his real maxim was, you know, when I need some money, I'll rob a bank. Right? And you can tell that that's his real maxim by knowing that it really was not that he was superstitiously checking all this stuff and that was crucial to what he was going to do, right? He wouldn't have done it anyway. Okay? You can call that, I'm sometimes tempted to call that the, the real maxim move, right? And various uh, contemporary Kant interpreters, uh, Kant interpreters and sympathizers, maybe most prominently Anora O'Neill, have pushed that. And I do think it, it helps with the, the Anscombe criticism. But now take it to the next step, right? Now imagine that there is someone who really is a very weird, very superstitious bank robber, right? The person who is actually only going to rob the bank if all this weird and unrepeatable stuff is in place, right? Not your normal bank robber, right? Very weird, very peculiar. But still, the critic says, look, that still wouldn't be right to rob a bank on that weird maxim, but it's going to pass Kant's test, right? So there you've got an example of something that's intuitively morally wrong but passes the test. Okay, at this point I think we can pop over to the PowerPoint. 
Um, so look, if you're persuaded, as I think you should be, by problem cases of that sort, I mean, you know, there's a good deal. I mean, there's a good deal more steps you could take in this debate before you were finally persuaded. But I think you should be. Right? Um, seems to me the right verdict on Kant's ethics, as expressed by the universal law test, is something like it can be at most sort of part of the truth about morality. It can't be the whole truth. Here's one way to flesh out that diagnosis a bit. This way is suggested uh, by the great 19th century philosopher Henry Sidgwick, who I've mentioned before, third of the great classical utilitarians. Sidgwick suggests um, the problem with Kant's way of thinking of things, of, of thinking that you can get all moral rightness and wrongness out of the universal law test, is it's really, you know, what that test is, is it's a test for um, the moral problem of people making special exceptions for themselves, right? You fa the idea is you sort of fail, an action will fail that test if, is if what you're trying to do is say, you know, I should be allowed to do this, but other people shouldn't. And Sidgwick suggests, well, I mean, that's one form of immorality, and insofar as it's good at catching that, then uh, Kant's test has something clearly right about it. But Sidgwick suggests that can't be the whole story, right? You can't get the whole story about moral rightness and wrongness just from knowing that everyone should be bound by the same rules. You've also got to know what the rules should be, right? And that, Sidgwick suggests, that the, the universal law test doesn't properly tell you, right? I mean, it, it, it sort of, it captures, you know, failures to bind yourself by the same rules as everyone else, but it doesn't tell you enough about what the rules binding on everyone ought to be. Finally, I want to think a little bit about deontology um, a standard problem for deontology and the um, evolution of deontological views. Right? So the most standard kind of problem for de deontology, for the simple deontology we initially introduced, is discussed by Rachel's in section 9.4. It's the idea that rules can conflict. Right? So the thought is, if there are this plurality of moral rules, um, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't break promises, etc., etc., right? You're going to be stuck because there will be times at which the only way you can avoid violating one is to violate one of the others. Rachel fleshes this out with a specific historical example uh, in the paragraph that goes from 132 to 133. He writes, Do such cases actually occur? There is no doubt that serious moral rules sometimes clash. During World War II, Dutch fishermen smuggled Jewish refugees to England in their boats, and sometimes they would be stopped by Nazi patrols. The Nazi captain would call out and ask the Dutch captain where he was going, who was on board, and so forth. The fisherman would lie and be allowed to pass. Clearly the fishermen had only two options. Either they lie, or they let everyone on their boat be killed. No third alternative was available. They could not, for example, remain silent or outrun the Nazis. Skipping a sentence, terrible dilemmas do occur in the real world. So. Um, standard problem with simple deontology is if you've got this, you know, this plurality of absolute rules, you, you've got a serious problem if you then encounter cases in which they conflict, right? In which the only way to, you know, uh, follow one is to violate another. There, though, look, is not 
the last word in formulating deontology. Indeed, in some ways, um, the most famous deontologist, the 20th century philosopher W.D. Ross, explicitly did not hold his view in this simple deontological form. I mean, the history here is actually that um, there were sort of people who took, had a version of simple deontology, including the now very obscure 19th century philosopher William Huell, right? They were criticized by Sidgwick in the Methods of Ethics in a way that convinced um, lots and lots of people, right? So then most philosophers of a deontological bent writing after Sidgwick, including Ross most famously, but others like C.D. Broad, thought, we can't formulate the view in this initial version. We have to try something different. Right? So here's, here's how Ross's version goes. I'll give you a PowerPoint on this in a tick. But um, what Ross talks about is what are famously called prima facie duties. Right? So the idea is that what we know is um, uh, insofar as something is a breaking of a promise, it's wrong. Insofar as something is telling a lie, it's wrong. So we know that um, certain features of actions have a, have a tendency to make them wrong, right? And that, those are sort of the deontological rules as Ross presents them. But Ross suggests we also know that you know some actions have more than one of these features, right? And at that point, we have to weigh these features against one another, and we can't, Ross thinks, know with the level of certainty that we know that uh, we know the rules of prima facie duty what the right answer in those cases is, right? So if two prima facie duties clash, we just have to sort of balance them and use this judgment, right? But still, you get the deontology in the form of your supposed knowledge of these principles of prima facie duty, the principles that tell you that you know, lying is a, sort of is a bad-making feature, promise-breaking is a bad-making feature, etc. Right? You guys got that? Sort of? I mean, I'll give you my PowerPoint on it. Uh, da -da. Here we go. Oh, it's terribly explicit. And then maybe I'd, I'll, I'll have one more go at conveying it to you. Yeah. All right, so, so let, let me do, maybe, uh, you know, just do this one more time, I guess. L look, let's use the example from Rachel's, right? So suppose what you're thinking about is two putatively absolute rules. The absolute rule tells you not to lie. The absolute rule tells you not to allow the deaths of innocent people, right? Then if you think about the um, case of the Dutch ship ca ship's captain from World War II that uh, Rachel's talks about, um, Simple deontology looks just incoherent or contradictory, right? I mean, you, you have cases where it tells you that you can't do this and you can't do that, right? I mean, it's, it's not only giving you no guidance, it appears inconsistent, right? 
So for Ross, the problem there is um, is solved by changing the status of the rules, right? The rule no longer says um, you should absolutely never do something that's a lie, right? The rule now says instead, you know, the fact that something is a telling of a lie tends to make it wrong, right? And so if there's no, no other relevant feature, it will be wrong, right? But the rule in that form allows for the possibility that the action is going to have more than one morally relevant feature and they'll have to be weighed against one another. So it doesn't um, generate contradictions in cases where there is more than one relevant feature and they point in different directions. Does that make sense? Yeah? It's odd, actually, that Rachel doesn't talk about that. I mean, I noticed that in this edition he has, in some ways, um, altered the discussion of deontology in Chapter 9, but there's still... Uh, my quick perusal of the index indicates no... Uh, you know, no reference to W.D. Ross, his name does not appear there. Yes? Uh, when you said uh, that Ross said you should break the status of one rules, uh, or one of the rules um, in conflict, are you saying that uh, you have to, like, make an exception, or put an exception in it, change it to have the exception to uh, do the other thing? Um, change it to have an exception. Well, um... I think that, I mean, it, that's not exactly R Ross's way of doing it, right? So it's not, I mean, so you might have the picture that um, what you can do is get a complete set of absolute deontological rules by starting with a simple version and then putting in all these exception clauses so that there are no clashes and so you've still got all these absolute rules, right? But that's not Ross, see? I mean, Ross says, in effect, you stick to the relatively simple rules, right? And you avoid the clashes, not by building in exceptions, but by changing the status. So they're not rules of duty, period. They're rules of prima facie duty. And to be a rule of prima facie duty is to specify a wrong-making feature, right? And specifying a wrong-making feature, or a right-making feature, yeah. um, specifying a wrong-making feature means telling you something such that if an action has this and no other feature, it will be wrong, right? But that leaves it open that if an action has this feature but also has some other feature that points in the other direction, it's not wrong and you've got in some way to weigh them, right? So you see how those are kind of two different strategies a deontologist might, might pursue in response to the conflicts, or in response to apparent conflict cases. So one strategy is add all these exceptions. So then you could try to have a whole bunch of absolute rules that will never clash, right? That would be one way to do it. I and mean, some people think you should do that, right? I mean, there are people of a deontological bent who go that way. But that's not Ross, see? I mean, Ross is, you know, because that's keep the rules absolute but make them very complicated, yeah? Ross, by contrast, is keep the rules simple, but in a certain way don't make them absolute. Make them instead prima facie. Good. Anything else on this? All right, we are done. <laughs>